on Cardano. We're going to have a, a really meaty chat. This way, folks, this way. There we go. There we go. I, I'm sure that happened to a few presidents and prime ministers in their time. Uh, so Cardano is a finance-friendly blockchain. And in particular, after the Vasil hard fork, we are seeing more and more decentralized financial applications launching on the protocol, given the huge amount of benefits that are offered by Cardano in this space. So how do we capitalize? How do we build and how do we grow? Well, our next panelists will answer that question. Brilliantly moderated by Rez Pabani from the Cardano Foundation. Uh, Rez will be joined by James Wagner um, from Indigo Labs, from Yarek Herniak with Axo Trading Protocol, Chetan Bafna from Ardana and uh, Eli from Qu Eli Naba from Quantos. This is a truly rock star panel who will help unpick the details. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a huge round of applause as we welcome them to the stage. Hi everyone, and welcome to our panel. So my name is Riz Pabani. I'll give you a bit of, bit of an introduction about myself. So um, I studied computer science. I spent the last 13 years working in financial services. Um, I work at the Cardano Foundation, and my role there is to um, manage enterprise partnerships. So today's panel is all about building on Cardano, and we have some very distinguished panelists um, including a very exciting announcement, which we're, we're really pleased to share with you. Um, capital in the traditional finance world has been very centralized, and that's created some barriers to entry for uh, developing nations and, and some other small uh, SMEs that want to try and get access to that. Through decentralized finance and Cardano and our blockchain technology, we're seeing a, a real new era usher in here where we can see more efficiency, more transparency, um, and more accountability through the, through the blockchain. Um, we're going to talk about a number of different things. We're going to start by defining DeFi. We're going to talk about stable coins. Uh, we're going to talk about regulation. And finally, what we think the future holds for DeFi. But to start off with, I'm going to pass over to, to James to introduce himself and to share a very exciting announcement. Yeah, um, so I'm James. I'm the business development manager at uh, Indigo Protocol. And uh, we are on mainnet today. It's uh, kind of a coincidence that it happened the same day as uh, the summit. So um, they were kind enough to let me kind of take the floor here and, and, and announce that. Um, so I'll just talk really quickly about um, I don't know where to start. It's been a whirlwind. I mean, we've been building for 18 months now. I've been on the team for a year, and it's just been go, 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 try to make this happen. And, um, you know, this week, actually, the rocket will launch at 3 o'clock UTC. Uh, so that's just this afternoon. It's just a couple hours. So, um, yeah, it's finally going to happen. It's been a, whirl, a whirlwind uh, this, this week trying to just all the logistics of getting this thing going. But um, we're super excited. We're super proud of it. Uh, so let me describe really quickly uh, what Indigo is. It's a, it's a platform to, for creating synthetic assets. You can create stable coins, crypto synths, indexes, uh, things of this nature. And um, the idea is that you are able to create, um, you're able to bring the real world onto the blockchain. Like our, our hashtag on Twitter is tokenize everything. And that's kind of our mission, is to, to bring the, the real-world assets, the real world, onto the blockchain uh, to give equal, ac equal opportunity and, um, to financial opportunities to everyone in the world. Um, the way we do this is by creating a synth of them. So I will just explain that really quickly in the most simple way I know how. Um, when you have things on the blockchain, you know, you can wrap them and bring them onto another blockchain. But when there's stuff in the real world, you know, how do you bring it over? You, you can't wrap the real world and, and, and bring it on. So the way you do that is you create synthetic representations, over collateralized synthetic representations of these assets, and you can create a synth of it that is essentially tracks the price of, of the real world. Um, so that is our mission, to tokenize everything. Um, we're super excited about our stable coin that actually we'll be trading in three hours. Uh, it'll be the first, um, I believe it's the first stablecoin on native 
assets um, stablecoin on Cardano. Uh, so Cardano will have a stablecoin in two hours. Yeah. Uh, IUSD is a particularly interesting solution. It's actually a basket of stablecoins. Uh, so with that theme of synthetics, um, it's actually triple pegged to um, USDC, USDT, and TUSD. And the way it works is it's, we take the, the median price of all three so that with that, the, that basket of stables were you know, one stable to fail, IUSD would, would still keep its peg. Uh, so it's a really unique product. It's fault tolerant, triple pegged, um, and we're, we're very excited to have that trading within a couple hours because Cardano needs it. Um, the other thing we're very proud of is, um, you know, we have, are pretty much obsessed with being, you know, as decentralized as we possibly can. From everything from our tokenomics to our emphasis on the DAO. And something that was very important for us was to have, for Indigo Protocol, to have uh, on-chain voting, you know, from day one. So we're also excited to say that, uh, you know, in a couple hours when we're live, we'll also have, uh, you know, complete governance. We'll have everything will be on-chain, all votes will be on-chain, and the protocol will be, you know, completely DAO controlled. Um, that wasn't easy, but we felt like it was important, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to, to be able to say that. Thank you, James. Congratulations. Yeah. That's amazing news, and we're all really excited to, to see how that evolves over the next year. Yep. Amazing. Another round of applause. Well done. Uh, continuing down this way, Yarek, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Uh, I'm Yarek. Uh, I'm founder of AXO Trading Protocol. Uh, what's AXO? AXO is a completely known way for decentralized finance. It's completely uh, decentralized and completely trustless, but at the same time, it provides the compliance that you need and it makes trading efficient. So I'm very excited uh, that you know, like we are finishing the work on AXO and you know, like we hopefully be following into the James and Indigo footstep uh, soon. I'm also CEO of Generation Lambda, high assurance uh, software development company. And you know, uh, so happy to see all of you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Eli Naba. I'm proje product manager of the eMoney token that we at Quantos are working on issuing. So Quantos is a Dutch blockchain company. We've been in the space since 2016. And right now we're working with the Dutch Central Bank on obtaining an e-money license. With that, we aim to tokenize the euro and bring, bring European liquidity onto the blockchain. Happy to be here. And uh, Cardano is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Chetan? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Chetan Bafna, and I'm the communications director for Ardana Labs. Um, uh, Ardana Labs is a two-part solution to build 4x on the Cardano blockchain for our community and for the larger uh, trading ecosystem. Um, we have a DEX solution and then a series of stable coins which will serve as the backbone for this potential 4x in this new digital economy. Thank you. Okay, so. What is DeFi? I, you know, coming from a traditional finance background, and, and I think we have many people in the audience who, who aren't in finance as well. I think one thing would be good to define first before we get into more detail on, on the topic would be, well, what does DeFi really mean? And Yarek, I think it would be a good one for you to answer. So to answer what's DeFi, we maybe should answer what's centralized finance. And centralized finance is some system where everything depends upon some central party not failing. And we all know it's not great, right? Like a lot of people gave money to some and there is no money no more, right? So what challenge decentralized finance tries to tackle is tries to remove this centralized counterparty and replace it with code. And this code better be you know, like very secure because now it's available to everyone to interact with. But if this code is secure, we no longer have to worry about this single uh, central party failure. And uh, actually, you know, like from all the points of view, from you know, like a retail user to institutions, it actually brings us to the next stage how finance should be done because we shouldn't trust somebody to be audited every month or even sometimes every year. And then you know, like a lot of money around the globe follows like the sun, and you know, like some banks are not solvent when the door closes. Uh, if we have all this proof on the chain of this quality of uh, finance then uh, we can suddenly you know, like, uh, build the financial products that are going to last. Uh, 
And you know, like everybody on the stage represents some form of that, and there is so much more of that in the Cardano community. And one thing that you know for sure from Cardano is we may be taking the turtle approach, but once we get there, you know, like it's going to last for many generations. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's a really important point to touch on. Um, you know, hearing from some of our other speakers in the, in, in, uh, over, over the weekend, trust is such an interesting thing. You know, when when it's there in a centralized system, no one really notices it. It's just it's just there, and then as soon as it's gone, it's like the the air is taken away from the room. Um, and I and I think DeFi really helps us, and and, and Cardano and the blockchain helps us operate in a, in a very trustless way, which I which I think is spot on. Um, one of the rationale one, one rationale we had for having this panel was. Um, and some of the things that we've been thinking about after the Vassal hard fork in, in September, some of the new features and, and, and how Cardano, the, the protocol, has evolved to usher in this kind of new era of DeFi. Maybe, Chatin, you could talk a bit about how, how that's happened. Sure, yeah. So, you know, before Vassal, uh, Cardano as a network for, for us was uh, a bit congested. Uh, there were bottlenecks in place, and it simply wasn't possible to build a DeFi protocol like ours because we relied on fast throughput. Now, after Vasil, we saw improvements in speed and the definitive foundation for scalability on the network to the point where our Oracle can now report accurate price data back to our platform during periods of extremely volatile price action. And that becomes important for us as a protocol, that, important, uh, that becomes important for um, all of you as consumers and as users of our platform. And you know, we're able to scale. It's so exciting to be a DeFi builder now on this network because we're now confident in the security of the network and confident in the security of our platform. Amazing. Yeah, maybe could you touch on maybe some of the more, the more detail behind that, like some of the features that were in and functions that were introduced? Sure. Vassil was the actual date where we enabled DeFi on Cardano, and there are two central pieces to that. The first was CIP31, what does it mean? It's reference input. So that's how you bring Oracle onto the chain. And you need Oracle to reference the data, you know, like in the scripts you're using from other parts uh, of the blockchain. And CIP33, which is actually very mind-blowing, uh, it's referencing the scripts. Before every transaction you create, you had to take this big chunk of code and put it alongside the transaction. So it was taking a lot of useful space. And transactions only 16 kilobytes, you know, like some, even like Game Boy, it's much less. Uh, and you have to fit you know, like the entire financial transaction in that. With reference scripts, you just publish it once and reference that. And here is the mind-boggling thing about Cardano. You can create a transfer that has hundreds of transfers to different parties. Well, now you can do it for actual referencing with dApps on the blockchain. And that's fully mind-boggling. You know, like I think we should stop asking how many transactions per second your blockchain has. We should start asking how many transactions per transaction your blockchain has. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does anyone have any other points, or like, wh wh why, why have you guys um, chosen to build on Cardano, Elliot? Maybe do you want to touch on that? Uh, yeah, I can or touch James? on that. I mean, Indigo, Indigo really wouldn't exist with, without Cardano. Cardano is kind of like cause it's an interesting question. People say like, why you know why Cardano? It's like that's the only way Indigo could exist. We we couldn't build it anywhere else. Um, some of the stuff we can do. Um, like we have a certain feature with our um, voting where the protocol is self-updating like no other blockchain can do that um, some of the ways our liquidation mechanisms work because of the way that Cardano's transactions are deterministic these liquidations are are much more reliable um, which is a property of UTXO so that's another thing that makes Indigo unique um, another th another thing that's phenomenal actually is about um, what Indigo is going to actually going to have um, in a couple hours is we'll have um, CDP liquid staking, so that when you have your ADA locked up uh, in a smart contract or UTXO um, as collateral, that ADA is still staked to your stake pool of choice, and you are still getting ADA returns on that ADA as it as it sits there. You know, no other blockchain can do that. Uh, so there's just so many phenomenal things, just from features for users or just just 
um, the way the architecture works, providing a, a better experience or a safer experience or a faster experience. Um, yeah, so to answer the question, you know, why build on Cardano, it's like Indigo would not exist without, without Cardano. And I would like to add to that is exactly the same for Axo. Uh, you may not realize not building these decentralized applications how game-changing Cardano is, but the fact that you lock the funds in UTXO, this enables the compliance because you know not only from what party the funds are coming, but exactly know like the trays that came so we can literally color all the coins to be fully compliant. And then, you know, like you can potentially replicate off-chain computation on the blockchains. But in Cardano, it came as the package, as the way you do things. And now you want to build, for instance, like a trading protocol that tries to compete with the centralized exchanges, which just put everything in one server, right? Well, now you can do that because you generated the proofs that that's what should happen. But this proof can be very complex. But the output of the proof to divide that can be very small. And Cardano enables you to do that. And, you know, like I've been waiting four years for the blockchain like Cardano to be able to realize the vision of the AXO protocol. So, you know, like, uh, and, you know, like with James, it's like, I think like there's so many, you know, like people, and it also makes so exciting the ecosystem because, you know, like all this really amazing builders are coming together with their vision and, you know, they're finally able to realize it in the way that actually makes sense. Yeah, I think I just feel like it's just getting started too. Absolutely. Over the next year or two, the stuff that I think Cardano is going to have a reputation for um, a lot of features and possibilities that other chains just don't have, and that's not well known yet. Um, but over the next couple of years, I think uh, we will make it known to everyone. Hi, hey, look, I'm so happy that FTX accidentally stayed at the end. <laughs> Very good. Um, one thing I'd like to understand is when it comes to managing your protocols, how are you, in, and, and one thing I hear all the time about Cardano is, is the community. And, you know, we, we have such a vibrant community, an active community. How, how are you guys in, engaging with, with your community? Eli, I don't know if you want to take that one first. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm actually part of the community member of the Middle East. So shout out to Nadim Keram, community founder. And the thing about Cardano is that you feel, let's say, this strong sense of community. You feel that, let's say, you come together with your peers, you exchange ideas, you exchange new features of, of why this technology is so interesting and what's happening in the eco space. And I think that it's a welcoming community that generally, let's say, wants to onboard new people, teach them why we're passionate about this technology and why we chose to, to build on, let's say, Cardano. And what makes Cardano, let's say, different from the rest of the blockchains. So, yeah, I mean, the community aspect is amazing. And actually, you can feel that in the room, in this event, and uh, throughout this weekend. I have one comment. Nice pool. Because every pool you go on Twitter is like 60, 70 percent Cardano. It's already very. <laughs> 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 yeah, very good. Oh, yeah, we, should, we, we definitely need to get some Cardano Summit polls going, and well, I'm sure we'll win all of those too. But um, I think, uh, just real quick, I think a big part of, you know, when you're looking at the community and the Cardano community, um, I think you should see yourself as the community. Absolutely. Because, like, for, for example, with Indigo Protocol or, or Adana or Axo, I mean, like, this is not our protocol. It's your protocol. Uh, this, it is completely going to be decentralized. The, the DAO is the one that makes the decisions. Um, so in a way, it's like uh, you see yourself as part of the community. Like I'm just a community member with the other community members, and we all kind of own this collectively. No one owes, owns it themselves. It's owned by everyone, and I'm, I'm, just, a part, I'm just a community member you know, with them in that process. And I think that's really important for when you're you know, talking to your community in the Twitter spaces or, or on Discord or on, um, you know, wherever, as I always remind myself, like, this is your, this is not my protocol, this is your protocol, this is, this is our protocol, we're all kind of in this together, we're all, we're all community, even if you're core team or not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, us at Ardana, uh, we've open sourced all of our code, uh, it's all on GitHub, and, you know, we did that because we recognized that the Cardano community is so engaged, so enthusiastic, and so ready to voice their concerns. So what better feedback can we get while we're building and iterating than from you, the public? So that, we took that ethos in mind, and you know, that's why we made that decision. And 
uh, blockchain as a technology is built on iterative design. And that is so true, especially true in the Cardano community. And you know, how this community changes and evolves over the years as institutions will come in is yet to be seen. And it's so exciting to us. And you know, that's one of the reasons that we released, for example, the Ardana Academy, where we educated people on uh, the basics of fiat currency, uh, stable coins, and how Forex um, evolves. So with this iterative design um, you know, and iterative community feedback, uh, we can see you know, a bright future uh, in how we engage with these new actors that come into this space, come into this community in the future. Awesome, thank you. So we're just going to move on into the challenges space. So you know, clearly, it sounds like we have a very good protocol. We have some really good technology. We have some some great builders, and, and you know, this today is all about building on Cardano. But what are what are what are the, some of the challenges you see in, um, in 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 building on on the protocol? Maybe Ellie, if you want, wouldn't mind starting. So I'd like to touch upon, let's say, the challenges on building on the protocol and let's say onboarding traditional finance on, on the protocol. So I think that until the moment we onboard traditional finance, what we're doing in DeFi or in any other, let's say, area of blockchain is just basically a proof of concept. So we're proving certain concept of what is possible with the technology and how, let's say, you can, how any uh, token issuer can issue a token and then create liquidity for his token through launchpads, for instance. But then here you see that okay, maybe we should put, let's say, a rule, let's say, some way to manage who gets to issue tokens and how do we inform, let's say, uh, our community or our investors about the risks associated by issuing that tokens. We've understood, let's say, how DeFi can eliminate counterparty risks, for instance, but we've also understood that maybe if you want to create a smart contract and then put it on chain, then maybe you should be able to, let's say, make sure that the smart contract runs properly before you commit billions of dollars to it. <laughs> We've, uh, <laughs> we've, I mean, and we've, we've understood, like, say, that maybe if you want to, let's say, issue a stable coin, then that stable coin should be really stable and no systemic, ri systemic risk should be associated with it, right? And before we can, let's say, bring that credibility to our ecosystem, I think we'll just be, let's say, still playing around, testing out new ideas. And, but the thing is that right now, I believe that we're at a very, like, crucial moment. And I believe, I genuinely believe that traditional finance is very interested in joining this space because Mika came out, which gives a clear, let's say, guideline on what to, how to be a token issuer. You have, let's say, the uh, verification methods that were uh, introduced by IOG that allows you to certify and verify a smart contract. You have, uh, let's say, companies like Acredius who are working in the Cardano space who developed an algorithm that was able to, uh, let's say, measure credit risk associated with each token issuers so that gives the investors real uh, let's say insight into what they're investing in and what are the risks that are associated with let's say such tokens so i genuinely believe that let's say in the coming few years it's going to be a very interesting uh, time for DeFi. such an interesting topic traditional finance am i right mm. but actually it's very interesting you should all very care much about that because most of you have a pension pension is an institution investing your money, right? And what a better way for them to invest the money by seeing, you know, like, all, not just the proof of, you know, like, not, like being solvent, just like actually proof of the reserves, proof how the business is being done on chain, etc. And, you know, like, uh, institutions would be happy to enter the space, but the space have to be ready for them. So what do they need? Well, first of all, they need compliance. And we are building centralized identity solutions. You know, like IMX and the Tala Prism, which I just mentioned too, but there's actually many more coming. And this is both beneficial to the user and to the institution. So the user gets a better KYC where the identity is not released straight away. But for instance, you know, like only when there's like a court or something bad happens, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like more private identity solution. On the other hand, institutions, well, they know now who they're dealing with, so they can follow the compliance processes. And there is so much more behind that, you know, like because you may not realize it, but there's like so many different levels of KYC. And there's not only know your customer, there's know your business, etc. right? So then by onboarding those solutions, you enable institutions to start, for example, like exchanging value on Cardano, right? Or instead of Cardano on a Hydra channel or some other way, but you enable them to do that. And also institutions, you have to understand they're in very competitive space. 
They don't want Honda Civic. They want Formula One and the best one. So you want to be able to build the solutions that when they enter the race, they help them to win, right? And by them winning absolutely, like everybody in the Cardinal space wins at the same time, right? So that's, for example, like why this off-chain competition is so important. And that's why, you know, like we have to go so far beyond the simple models of AMM, you know, like constant for one market makers, etc., because we need to bring this huge knowledge that already exists, like stochastic finance, right? We have quants, we have the risk managers, etc. We have to be able to onboard all of them onto the chain and use those tools. Another part is just not on the chain, is the tooling itself. We need like the tooling that they can use, you know, like, hey, this portfolio manager can use these funds. I also don't want them to buy the shit coins that they can mine themselves, right? Like you have to have the full chain of compliance, right? It's like compliance in every institution. Uh, and, you know, uh, finally, you know, like there's like engaging with the regulators on the right way. So when this institution, you know, for example, like thinking, hey, actually, this would help with X, Y, Z, right? That they have a clear path to onboard because, you know, like already it was followed and explored with regulators, how the regulators look at that. And uh, I actually think, contrary, you know, like despite having such an amazing, vibrant community, Cardano is one of the few blockchains that actually is ready for institutional adoption, and that's like very exciting, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, and I think in, in my experience from um, the Cardano Summit, I've, I've met many institutions, um, financial institutions, and, and I feel like they're, I mean, particularly in Switzerland as well, there seems to be a very kind of welcoming um, environment for, for blockchain and crypto. And, and I feel like there's a big wall of capital coming from you know, various investments that's, that's ready to come into the space. And I feel like some of the challenges and, and solutions you guys touched on, seeing that evolve is going to be, be really, really interesting. Um, and one thing that I think will be important to, to getting some of that institutional capital into, into DeFi will be stable coins. And I know, I know James um, just, just announced his, but, but Yarek, maybe what, could, you, could you talk us through like, why, why are stable coins so, so important to the ecosystem? Why, why, do, why do we even need them? So there are only two things you need to know about stable coins. They are not stable, they're not coins. <laughs> 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 but in all seriousness, there is a reason why we want uh, stable coins, right? Uh, all of us can say like in a form, perform an investment on the blockchain, right? We are not buying Hosky uh, for Hosky to go to zero, even though like we all say that, right? Uh, at the end of the day, there is like a currency we use for a living, right? Where maybe like you want to buy a house, uh, maybe you are saving for something. And at the end of the day, uh, we want to have the most of the settlement currency. And settlement currency is the thing that you want to multiply, right? Uh, and you need to have it on the chain because, for example, like when there are times like now, you know, like we are entering the bear market and we are at the bottom of the bear market or close to the bottom, right? Uh, then when it's starting to happen, like you have to have the ability to enter the assets that are safe. Also, so another thing to do with the stable coins, which is um, they, like the f f uh, foreign exchange, so like the currency markets, they're humongous. So they're much less volatile than the smaller markets that are your investment. So we also need them for that, that you know, like uh, as you are trading, you know, like you're going back in, like, into the investment and back into the stable coin. And uh, actually, I'm so lucky to be sitting surrounded by three people who are involved in the projects developing stable coins. And who knows, in the future, we have even like more stable, stable coin, like an index of the stable coins. Yep. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you say that <laughs> the stable coins are not <laughs> stable. Yeah, it's because they're pegged to USD. Uh, well, that's a big part of it. Um, you know, USD is still the benchmark of, of stability. Uh, in the world, but there's, you know, you can get into things like stable value coins. So they aren't necessarily pegged to USD directly. There's like, there's other things that you can do. Um, Cause at the end of the day, that is what the value of a stable coin is. You, you can keep the value of what you have in the face of, uh, be it inflation or disaster or, or volatility or something like this. Like you need, you need a safe haven. And you know, one thing I'm excited about in the future is you know yes a stable if you're thinking of a stable coin you're basically thinking of something that is pegged in some way shape or form to the price action of the US dollar um, but there's other ways you could do this there's things there's indexes there's baskets there's there's basically stable value coins where 
the value of that asset is does not go up or down. It stays the same, but it's not pegged to the U.S. dollar. It would be a more creative solution. And so we may or may not be thinking about that. Jarek may, may or may not be thinking about that, but uh, you'll probably see some pretty cool stuff uh, in the future, I would say. Just speculation. Uh, yeah. So we at Quantos also have, let's say, a very specific understanding of the uh, stable coin market and, let's say, the crypto assets market uh, in general. So we understand them according to the MICA regulation that just came out. And inside MICA, what they do is they create, let's say, they separate uh, two types of stable coins mainly. So you have the, on one side, the asset reference tokens that are, let's say, tokens that are issued to represent something that exists in the real world. And those can be, let's say, currencies or a basket of currencies. They can be commodities or a basket of commodities. But then the thing is about those tokens is they do not give the consumer any claim against anything in the digital world. They're just, let's say, indexes, tokens that are issued to index a certain asset. And then on the other hand, you have, uh, let's say, e-money tokens, which is what we are, Quantos, are working on. And e-money tokens are basically um, digital tokens, digital representations of the euros in your bank account. And it's not that they're a stable coin, they're not a stable coin, they, like, it's just tokenizing the euro, right? So we take the euro from your bank account, tokenize it, and put it on, on the chain. And once we give you a, uh, let's say, a token that is issued by us, a money token that is issued by us, this gives you a, uh, how would you call it? Yeah, this gives you a claim against us to redeem that token at par value and this claim is guaranteed by the Dutch Central Bank. So let's say that's the highest authority, that's the highest financial authority in our market. So our, our coin will never depeg, it will never let's say be something that where the value fluctuates, it will always be one coin equals one euro and that's something that's guaranteed by the Dutch Central Bank. And if you are not able to guarantee that then we go to jail and that's let's say something th serious. And we want to bring that let's say level of trust to the Cardano blockchain and then use that to empower, let's say, DeFi solutions, use that to allow, let's say, token issuers in Europe to start issuing tokens, raising funds for their SMEs, creating, let's say, the, bringing the real markets into blockchain. And I think this is very essential and this will be, let's say, a catalyst for, let's say, the mass adoption of DeFi. Perfect. Yeah, and uh, just touching on, you know, kind of what we see in DeFi as a, as a decentralized stablecoin, right? Um, we, we find that there are different models out there, of course, and they've been touched on here by the rest of the panel. Um, and looking at, say, the biggest centralized entities like USDC with Circle and USDT with Tether, um, we find that in addition to those, say, on the Ethereum side, right, we also have DAI, which is a collateralized stablecoin that uses a large portion of the assets that are collateralized in it are other centralized stablecoins. So DAI, for example, has a potential vulnerability in the case of insolvency. It's not truly decentralized. But building on Cardano, you know, building fresh collateralized stablecoins, there's an opportunity here for us to really be discriminant about which assets are able to be collateralized. And this is the opportunity to unlock our value of our ADA really, and put that first and foremost and protect the um, security of our respective platforms here uh, that are issuing collateralized stablecoins. And, you know, us at Ardana, we believe that we can launch uh, DUSD, our first stablecoin in, in Q1 of this upcoming year. So we're incredibly excited to see, um, you know, the community feedback and, of course, uh, IUSD, uh, how those play over. Awesome. And you know, clearly it sounds like everyone has some sort of like regulatory aspect to this. We're, you know, getting into stable coins. We're talking about, you know, uh, currencies issued by, by governments and, and you know, obviously talking with the Dutch Central Bank. It'd be interesting, maybe Chetan, to start with you. What, what do you see the regulatory landscape? When you talk about what, what does it feel like? Are you talking to regulators yourself? Um, how are you engaging with them? Sure, yeah. Um, so make no mistake, regulation is coming. I mean, we've seen events in the broader market that... Um, lend to the need for regulation. But where is that regulation going? It's primarily going to be the centralized actors that are regulated. We've seen uh, abuse of customer funds by, say, centralized exchanges, uh, but true DeFi and DAO structures are going to be difficult to regulate fundamentally because of how they're structured. And in the United States, for example, we have uh, something called the Howey test. 
which assesses uh, whether something, an asset, meets the standard of being a security. And DeFi has proven time and time again that it can pass this fundamental test. And you know, people in the US are free to interact with these different protocols. You know? And that lends the opportunity for us here in the Cardano community to keep vigilant for any threat in our ability to interact with protocols that we so choose. You know, fundamentally, we have to educate regulators. We have to keep them informed because even if those regulators already know, because fundamentally, if we can understand DeFi, their staffs can certainly educate them on DeFi. So it's up to us to ensure that we generate so much value in this ecosystem that we bring in the institutional players, the same ones that are there lobbying the older solutions to the same problems that we are addressing in DeFi. It's, it's up to us. I would actually argue there is already quite a lot of regulation in the space because if you want, like uh, if your association or foundation or some other entity are building like a centralized protocol, uh, you can be fully compliant today. There's enough regulation clarity. It may be hardly accessible to the new people to the centralization space, but it exists. So it's very important that we all follow it. Uh, and just for instance, you know, like the uh, AXO token has been uh, certified by regular authority uh, as a payment token. And, uh, you know, like I would suggest, you know, like we as a committee should care about it more. And here's my request to you, uh, because you are at the end of the day driving for so let me explain why. We need self-regulation. So, you know, like when, for example, you look in the banking, it's not that they have so much regulation, that's not that way breaking. They actually understand that they need to uphold a certain operational procedures for this space to stay healthy, that there's a lot of self-regulation. And now, you know, like all the best self-regulation that exists, everybody else has to rise to this level because otherwise they are not competitive in the market. But who decides that the self-regulation is important? You as the users, right? Because, you know, like you don't want to hold your, for example, like money in the failing bank. And the same idea, I you know, like you should apply to thinking about centralized finance, right? Uh, what self-regulation this protocol applies that makes sure that my funds are safe? Uh, or what does it do to be more transparent, right? And the risk of the regulation is if you want to self-regulate, then of course regulators is going to come. Of course, they may not understand the space, they're new to it. And not only that, there may be you know, like ulterior motives, or not even like transparent ulterior motives. And the more regulation they had is to enter the space, so a lot of really honest, good players can be regulated out of the market. And then DeFi just remains like a label that nobody can use. Because at the end of the day, you have to go to some entity, you know, like there's like allegations in the FTF, FTX saga that there was some collusion with the regulators, and which would make basically FTX the only platform where the US, uh, you know, like uh, users could interact with, uh, like DeFi, how crazy is that? And that's so important, we self-regulate first, that when the regulators come, hey, we need regulation for this, they look, oh wow, they are so well self-regulated, let's just adopt what they have been doing, right? We can create the norm. I'd just like to say one thing. So why is regulation needed in DeFi? I mean, try playing a football game with no rules. Right? <laughs> just try imagining that, OK, in a football game, you can go up, come up to the goalkeeper, punch him in the face, and score a goal. And if this is, let's say, the type of game that we want to play, then yeah, sure, let's keep the regulators out. But if you want to play, let's say, on the big game, in the big level, then we need to work with regulators, and we need to regulate the space. And we need to understand, let's say, what is possible and what should be done and what should not be done because it will bring systemic risk. Luna did not fail because the protocol acted the way it, let's say, it, uh, against it the way it should have acted. It failed because there was inherent systemic risk in the system and the systemic risk caused the ex explosion. But then the protocol acted exactly as it should have acted. And once we learn to, let's say, separate risks, once we learn to, let's say, separate, let's say, exposures, and bring those ideas that have kind of working in traditional finance, bring them into DeFi, then I think we'll have, let's say, a nice game to play. Yeah. Perfect. And maybe just um, maybe a final word from each of you. What, what do you guys see happening in the next 12 months in your, in your respective protocols? Like, um, you know, what, what, what can we be looking out for? Maybe just 30 seconds each. Sure, yeah. Um, so as I had mentioned before, um, we're excited to uh, 
uh, announced, you know, DUSD is coming, and it's coming soon. We believe uh, Q1 is going to be our window. And, you know, uh, above all, we have to understand that this is going to be the first. There are going to be other stable coins that have come into this ecosystem, and we hope to be a uh, mover in that and a uh, collaborator in that space, uh, providing solutions for all of you. Yeah, over the next 12 months, I, I would say I'm excited and also paranoid because uh, 2022 hasn't really been an awesome year for in, in many ways. Uh, there have been a lot of people who have lost money, like preposterous amounts of money, and this is happening repeatedly. Uh, so the chickens might come home to roost a bit there. I just don't know what it's going to look like. Um, but I'm optimistic because, I mean, JP Morgan put out a tweet and said, like, every one of these disasters has been because of a centralized hand. Um, so there's, it's clear that people are seeing the theme there. And uh, I'm really excited to, for Indigo, Axo, Ardana, and, and just true DeFi um, on, on, on Cardano over the next 12 months. I think uh, next year will be a much different ecosystem. Launch, adoption, word dominance. And by word dominance, I mean us as a Cardano community having the best platform to trade on. And the one where actually finally a lot of financial institutions can come in and start using as well. So I'm absolutely excited for the next 12 months. Uh, for Quantos, it'll be basically issuing our e-money token on Cardano, and that's something that I personally am very excited about and looking forward to. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, I mean, just to, just to summarize here, I think, you know, we, we started with defining DeFi. We, 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 it feels like there's a lot of... Um, institutional capital ready to come into the space. We've got, you know, our amazing panelists here, which are building these decentralized protocols, which will welcome all that capital and start distributing it to, to those in need, building on those kind of social and economic systems that we can do, do on the blockchain. Um, and it sounds like we've got a really, really exciting future ahead of us in Cardano and, and on our respective blockchain. So thank you very much to my panelists and thank you and everyone enjoy lunch. Thank you. Follow, follow me.